for some reason my audio is a bit lagging behind in my speakers which is a little offsetting okay so uh, we start our uh, exploration of the contour model with this simple example which illustrates this divergence of second order beliefs and then we'll devote the rest of our lecture to seeing how this disagreement actually enters the trading strategies and leads to higher trading volumes. So in this simple example, suppose that you have two groups of traders, label them as I and J respectively, and uh, say that the fundamental value of the asset, called theta, you can call it V if you want, uh, has two components, theta I and theta J. And traders in group I get a signal that's informative about the first component, theta i, plus some noise, and traders in the second group get a signal about theta j, again plus some noise. And on top of that, there is also a public signal about the sum of two thetas. So suppose for simplicity that all of these random variables are mutually independent and normal with zero mean. So what do you have then? Or the kind of beliefs that we will have. First, let us look at the case when there is no public signal whatsoever. In particular, we want to, for example, take trader i, and first think, what is his opinion about theta? So you can um, split this expectation into the sum of expect expected value of theta j and expected value of theta i. And trader i will have some information about theta i. Trader i will not have any kind of information about theta j. Once again, we assume that there is no public uh, signal at this point meaning that this expectation will be just AI XI. Some um, XI scaled by some amount. We do not need to recenter it because everything is zero mean. Zero meme. Now, if we also want to look at Trader I's second order belief, for now we're not saying why it matters, we're just trying to compute these beliefs. Um, in particular, we are looking at what does trader I think about trader J's expectation of theta. Because in the model that will follow, this is kind of the price that at which trader I will expect to sell his asset to trader J. So what does trader I knows about the information that trader J has? Trader J receives this private signal ZJ which is informative of theta j. And once again, there is no public signal. But trader i does not know anything about theta j. Because trader i's signal is only informative about theta i. Meaning that trader i will have some idea about what the fundamental value of the asset theta is. But trader i will have no idea what trader j thinks about this fundamental value. So the second order belief will be just zero. In particular, it will be zero um, I had some thought, but I forgot it within the span of two seconds. M from the mathematical point of view, this will be zero because this double conditional expectation if you use the law of iterated probabilities, it will reduce to just the unconditional expectation of theta because xi and zj are mutually independent. And we assume that this unconditional expectation of theta is zero. Uh, similarly, if you're curious about that, trader j will also have no idea about how trader i valued the asset. Not that it matters for our purposes. So. Oh yeah, I wanted to say that this trader I's opinion about trader J's valuation for the asset does not depend on XI, does not depend on the signal that trader I gets. 
So second order belief is independent of the trader's private signal. Now let us suppose that there is a public signal, which we assumed from the very beginning. So in addition to their xi and zj respectively, both traders observe some common signal y, which is informative about the total theta. Once again, let us start with the first order beliefs. Um, we can decompose this conditional expectation of theta conditional on the information available to player i as again the conditional expectation of theta j and theta i. Conditional on the information the trader i has, which is private signal xi and the public signal y. So in trying to infer what theta i is, trader i will be able to use both private signal xi and the public signal y. So both of those have some information about theta i. So due to normality, this conditional expectation will be just given by some com linear combination of those signals, called beta i xi plus ci, sorry, bi xi plus ci y. Now also trader i has some information about theta j, so this public signal y is informative about theta, which is theta i plus theta j, so given some information about theta i, trader will also know something about theta j. So his conditional expectation of theta j will be given by some function of um, public signal. Although really private signal should also enter here. So let us look now at second order beliefs once again. Let us look at what trader i thinks about trader j's valuation for the asset. And if you go through the motions, I'll explain the intuition in a second, if you go through the motions you'll arrive at this expression, which is, uh, which depends positively on the public signal y, but it depends negatively on the private signal xi. A uh, question from Andreas, where do the ABCD constant come from? You can compute them if you actually compute all these conditional expectations properly using the distributions of all the respective variables. So something similar to what we did on Friday in a long and painful way. Here you can do it a little simpler because you just care about the expectations. Um, so I'm not doing it, it would, it would be the same thing, it's very mechanical. So, uh, and not very insightful. But these A, B, C, and D are something that you can actually compute. So you can try to compute them in your free time or you can look at the paper um, to see how he derives them. Also, just a note, some of the notation here can be slightly different from notation in the paper. Because I may have tried to bring it closer to the notation we had in class in the other models. But going back to this expression, one thing that you'll get is that the second order expectation will be decreasing in xi. Meaning that the higher is your private signal, the more, the higher you think the expectation of theta i is, the lower you think the other player will value the asset. Now, this is a curious result, right? How, how does this happen? Why does this happen? Let me try to do it uh, in a very quick and reduced form way. So you have theta equal to theta i plus theta j. Suppose just for a second that you know theta i and theta perfectly. Then what do you think theta, theta j is? You don't need to think, here you will know theta j perfectly. So theta j will be equal to theta... sorry... theta minus theta i. 
That's the intuition for that. You have a signal about the total real value of the asset theta. But if you if you think if you received a high signal about theta i, you think that it's mostly due to the component that you know of. That high theta is because theta i is high, which must mean that theta j is low, which must mean that the signal that the other player will get, player j will get, that signal will also be low. That player j will value the asset um, at a low amount. This is the intuition behind it. So going back. I told you that this is due to very particular construction of um, these information sets and signals. In particular, it is due to the fact that these two players, these two kinds of players, have signals about some components of theta and their and the big public signal about the total value of theta. This is not a standard assumption in the model. I am not saying that it is unreasonable. It might quite be reasonable if you have an idea for what theta i and theta j is and why different players must be heterogeneously informed about those. What I'm saying is that the literature did not have this kind of distinction before and that's why uh, second order beliefs did not actually matter. So what is what you would more, more typically assume in a paper is that x, i, and z, j are all um, signals about just theta. Meaning, if you're player i, you have some signal theta, you have some signal x, i about theta plus some noise, and you have some public signal y about theta. So you'll just have two points to try to infer theta from. And player J will have the same thing, except he will have slightly different second signal ZJ. But this ZJ will still be about all of theta, not about one of the components of theta. And what Condor actually shows or argues in the paper is that that kind of standard assumption is the thing that's driving the results. While if you separate theta into components that players are heterogeneously informed of, then you'll get second order beliefs being important. So the claim, the main claim here is that this divergence of second order beliefs, the fact that higher private signal leads me to think that you will have a low private signal, is the thing that will lead to trade. And um, actually one thing, yeah, one thing to note is that this divergence grows the more precise public information is. So one way to see it is that um, if we had, at the point when we had absolutely no private inf public information, second order beliefs were constant, did not depend on private information, then once we added private information, the second order beliefs started to, to, to diverge. So these are two points through which you can draw a line, but you can derive this whole observation a lot more formally. So divergence grows the more precise public information is, which means in particular that if you had some time period without, private, without public information, there was no divergence, but then a public in announcement happened which generated some public information, which means that trade volume increased. So overall, this would explain why there is more trading around public announcements. So public announcement generates public information, which leads to divergence of second order beliefs. And this divergence force, um, incentivizes agents to trade with one another. So this is the big insight of the paper. And from this point onwards, we will go through this chain of reasoning, through this logic, in a lot more detail. 
So we will actually show that uh, this second order belief is what drives the agents to trade. So we will show this claim in the framework of a Condor model. But if you will not follow, if you do not follow that um, formal model, the insight that I just gave you condenses it quite uh, concisely. So let us dive into the model. Unless there are any questions so far. So as I advertised, this will be a three-period model. We have I traders. We have two groups of traders. So I traders and J traders. And they operate at different periods. So in period one, I traders get to observe all their information and trade with one another and with the aggregate supply. Then in period two, I traders leave the market selling all their positions to J traders. So J traders enter the market, I traders leave the market. And they trade with one another. And there is also some new aggregate supply, just the noisy one, the uninformed one. And then in period three, theta is actually realized and um, J traders do get to consume the asset. So they receive value theta from having the asset at the in the end. Now we will assume that there is a continuum of traders of every type, i and j. All of these traders are thus competitive, meaning they are price takers. They submit individual demands di to the market. And what we will assume is that they can condition their demand on the price. So if we draw parallels to Kyle model with risk aversion that we looked at on Friday, these traders in our model will behave like the dealer did in the Kyle model, not like the informed traders did in the Kyle model. Because informed traders just submitted a market order which executed at some price that they had no control over, while the dealers submitted price schedules so they could condition the amount they traded on price. These traders are the same in that they can condition their demand DI on the price. Now this demand DI will be an interior value because the traders are risk averse once again. So they will not want to buy or sell infinite amounts of the asset. In particular, we assume that these traders have exponential utility, CARA, constant absolute risk conversion utility. And given the setup that we set up, the wealth that enters this utility function, W, of these traders will be given by di times p2 minus p1 for traders i. So traders i submit demand i, they pay price p1, for buying the asset and then they get price p2 when they sell the asset and this is their net wealth that they gain from it and they gain exponential utility from consuming that extra wealth for j agents they submit uh, order dj they pay price p2 for it and they get value theta per unit of the asset that they end up with I realize now that these W's and D's should have small subscripts. So this is W small i and D small i. So it's W small j and D small j. So these are not aggregate values, these are uh, values for each individual trader. Another assumption that we make is about the aggregate supply of the asset. We assume that it is normal in both periods. So in period one, there is some aggregate supply U1 against which the I traders trade. And this aggregate supply U1 is normal with zero mean and some variance. And then we have the same total aggregate supply U2 
in period 2, which is also normal with mean 0 and some variance. Now, I would like to clarify here that this supply of the asset in period 2 includes period I traders who are willing to sell. So, for market to clear, what should happen is no. Yes. We will go through it in greater detail when, when we get to it, but I wanted to make it clearer right now. Uh, in, in period 1, asset supply U1 must equal the demand D1 that traders, DI, sorry, that traders in the first period uh, exercise. What do you do with demand? You submit. Whatever you do with demand, asset supply U1 must equal demand DI. In period 2, asset is demanded by J agents. So this is the total demand for the asset. And it must equal asset supply U2. And we think that this U2 is partly due to agents I, who sell their holdings, who sell their U1 holdings, plus there is some extra aggregate supply which is extra, uh, which is um, created in period 2. And what we assume is that this aggregate U2 is normal and independent of U1. So this is an important and not quite, res not quite intuitive assumption, so I wanted to go through it in greater detail. Okay, so as I said, some names, some labels will be different from the paper because I tried to uh, bring it a little closer to what we had in class. The existence of this random supply or the randomness of this aggregate supply implies that prices will not be perfectly informative. So traders J in the second period get to observe the price from the previous period. But this will not allow them to perfectly single out what was theta i, what was the information that agents had in period 1. Because p1 might be high due to high theta i, or it might be due to low aggregate supply. Okay? Now, let us um, gradually move on to the agent's maximization problem. So we have set up the model, let's begin solving it. We only have these two kinds of strategic agents, so let us look at their maximization problems. Let us begin with I traders. They have this maximization problem, they maximize their expected wealth given everything they know. The only thing they choose is their demand, di, again this should be small i, and this should be small w with a small i. Uh, they choose their demand di to maximize the expected wealth, the ex sorry, expected utility from wealth, different thing, and the information that they have at the point when they make their decision is they get to observe their private signal xi, they get to observe the public signal y, and as I said, they can condition on p1. So this is their maximization problem. Now a thing to notice here. Wi, if you look at it, is given by this value, right? It's di times p2 minus p1. What is random here? Trader i will know di, they will know p1, the only uncertain thing is P2. The only thing that trader I is uncertain about is 
how much they will get to sell their asset at to traders j and the way we will set this problem up the way that we will assume the equilibrium will look like this p2 will be a linear function of all the uh, things in p2 uh, in period 2 meaning it will be linear in p1 in u1 and u2 meaning in particular that this p2 will be normal meaning in turn that the wealth of agent i will also be distributed normally and one thing that you may or may not know is that when you have carry utility and wealth has normal distribution so this monetary element in the utility has normal distribution the problem can be written sorry Kara preferences are equivalent to mean variance preferences that we know and love so traders who maximize their carry utility look the same as traders who explicitly have mean variance preferences and they maximize expectation minus gamma times the variance and once again this is a peculiar equivalence between um, for the Kara normal model for Kara utility and normal distributions so we will use this we will use this representation uh, this this mean variance representation to solve the agents problem j traders will have the same um, thing happening to them in their case the only random part of their wealth of their terminal wealth wj is theta by analogy to traders i and this theta is actually explicitly normal so it's easier to show that this wj is normal so we can apply the same equivalence and uh, solve a mean variance maximization problem or maximization problem of mean variance utility so if we plug in the w's into these expectation and variances and once again the only uncertain terms in those are p2 in wi and theta in wj respectively If you plug those and uh, take first order conditions, what you will end up with is this. Actually, let's maybe do this explicitly. It does not take that long. So this, this, agents, maximization. So they have, um, Let's, for example, look at agents i. They maximize over di the expectation of w i conditional on x i. Uh, I think it's a superscript, right? x i y p one minus gamma over two times the variance of this. Same wealth given the same conditioning variables. And this is the same as once we plug in all of the once we plug in the wealth into these. If I actually copy all of this. If we plug in the wealth, our wealth was equal to d i times p two minus p one. And the same wealth here equal to once again since only p2 is the random variable we only need to take the expectation of p2 and variance of p2 so you'll have d i times the expectation of p2 minus d i p1 minus gamma over 2 times the variance of this term 
So the variance of this term will reduce to, we can take di outside of variance with a square. And the variance of p2 minus p1 is the same as just variance of p2. p1 is a constant and does not affect the variance. So this is the utility that we are maximizing. And if you take derivative of that with respect to di, so first order condition, it will look like... Once again, let me copy this. This di will disappear, this di will disappear, and here we'll have di squared change it to 2di. So we'll have just di and gamma over 1 half will annihilate with the 2. So this is the derivative of the utility function, it should be equal to zero. If you express di from here, in terms of everything else, it will be exactly the same as what we've got in the slides. So it will be given by this, and the same for trader j. And here we relabel the variance of p2 conditional on all this as a tau. So tau are the precision of agent's information. Uh, tau square p2 is the precision of agent i's information about p2. Uh, tau theta, tau square theta is the precision of agent's information about, of agent j's information about theta. Okay, so these are the agent's optimal demands. What do we do with it? In order to compute the equilibrium, we need to actually know how these prices behave. So how do we take the expectation of P2 condition on all this? How does P1 form? How does P2 form, given all the market demands and um, supplies? So let us look at that. Now it's 3 o'clock, we are out of time, but as I said, we are going over time and I think this might be a long one, so it's another 20-30 minutes at least. As I said, you are free to leave. There will be a video on t available on Twitch, on YouTube. And uh, I encourage you to go through this model, but I've already given you the main insight that will that we'll get out of it. So, but let us continue going through this model. How do we arrive to an equilibrium? Well, we do our usual assumption that everything is linear. In particular, that prices are linear functions of everything that's relevant. Everything is linear. Everything is linear when you're doing finance. Uh, so, in particular, we will assume that P1 is a linear function of theta i, the public signal y, and the aggregate supply u1. One thing to note here. Price in period 1 does depend on theta i, on this component of uh, the asset value. However, no single agent in period 1 actually knows theta i. Right? There are a lot of i-traders, a continuum of i-traders, each of which has some private signal xi. But given that there are many of them, there is a continuum of them, the market in aggregate will have a continuum of signals about theta i, which will be enough to perfectly identify uh, theta i. But this is a consequence of us assuming that there are a continuum of traders. Now, similarly, we make uh, the same assumption about P2. We'll say that it's a linear function of theta j. For the same reason, there is a continuum of j traders. It's a linear function of public signal y, of aggregate supply y2, u2, sorry. And there is also a new term q1. So q1 is uh, how we'll call, is what we'll call the price signal of period 1. So Q1 is the information about theta that time two traders, J tra traders, extract from P1, from the price that was established in the market before they arrived.
So th this is yet another piece of information that J traders have in comparison to I traders that exists in period two. So we need to incor include it in the price. And these prices will be linear functions. So we'll have, once again, a lot of different coefficients, A1, B2, C1, C2, E1, E2, G2. Now at this point, the same question arises. How do we find out these coefficients? At this point, we cannot. So at this point, we are assuming that prices take linear form with some coefficients. Once we go full circle, once we close the model, we will have enough restrictions on all the model values, which will allow us to identify what these coefficients actually are. But we cannot identify them at this point. So at this point, this is just a guess. Um, as well as the guess that prices are linear in everything. Okay, how do we... What are these price signals? Just going back to them. How do we find Q1? So let us define Q1 as the conditional expectation of theta i, given price P1 and y. So this is the information that traders in period 2 have about theta i. And this is the only piece of information that they have about theta i, really. Well, along with the private signal. But how do we find it? Let us uh, look back at the this price equation for P1, and let us do some manipulations with it. So let us multiply both sides by U1, divide by A1, and uh, take C1Y to the left-hand side. If you do this, you will arrive to this kind of expression down here in 5, the lower green box. And what you can do now is you can take conditional expectations of both sides. So take expectation of both sides conditional on P1 and Y. What you'll have on the left-hand side is the same thing. The fraction will just remain the fraction. So P1 and Y are random ex ante, but conditional on P1 and Y, these will just be known values. On the left-hand side, we take the expectation of theta I conditional on P1 and Y, which is what we want. And we'll have minus 1 over A1, expectation of U1 conditional on P1 and Y. And if you do the computation, you will actually see that this uh, will reduce to zero. So you could think that price P1 actually has some information about the aggregate supply U1, uh, but especially given the info also have information about the y, but as it will turn out, it, this is not actually true and you cannot extract any meaningful information about u1 from all that. Which means in the end that this conditional expectation of theta, y, theta i conditional on p1 and y will be equal to this fraction. In a similar way you can figure out q2, the price signal of period 2 price, p2, about theta j, but uh, I don't think we'll actually use it anywhere. Okay, moving on. We have equations for prices and we have uh, equation of prices in terms of Q1 and we have an expression for Q1. Why did we do all this? Sorry, going back here. We did it because we had these prices and expectations of these prices back into the agent's optimal strategy. So we wanted to find out what these expectations were and also how these prices are determined. So let us go back to these expressions for Ds and let us try to plug in or first try to compute these conditional expectations given all the information that we'll have. This is what we do here. The conditional expectation of P2 given X1, Y, and P1 is the same as conditional expectation of P2 given Xi1 and Q1, meaning that P1 and Q1 carry the exact same amount of information, the exact same information, period, which is just by definition of Q1. So Q1 gives us the information contained in P1. 
So then everything is normal here, mutually normal, meaning that this conditional expectation, again, if you go through the motions in detail, which we do not do, can be written as a linear combination of signals. So P2 will be random normal, dependent on the, all the same normal independent variables that Xi, Y and Q1 also depend on. There are a bit too many moving parts in this model, so it's not trivial to go through, especially quickly. Quickly enough to only go over time by half an hour. But again, if, you're, if you crave more details, I encourage you to go to the paper and uh, read the appendix. Okay, so we can express this conditional expectation of P2 as a linear function of signals, xi, y, and q1. We can do the same for a conditional expectation of theta by the second player, by player j, by any player j. And it will be, again, a linear combination of zj, the private signal, y, q1, and q2. So we do actually use q2. I take my words back. Then we can plug these expectations back into the optimal strategies, and we will get that agents' demands in equilibrium should be given by this. Once again, linear combination of everything we had. Then you can impose market clearing, as I've already uh, described to you, meaning that the aggregate supply in period 1, U1, should be equal to the sum of all the individual I agents' demands. So it should be equal to the integral from 0 to 1 over the continuum of i agents of uh, di, d1 i star, so of these values. And this integral is how this xi will turn into uh, theta i. Then you do the same market clearing for u2. And these market clearing conditions will be, sorry, just looking, no, okay, let us stay here for a second. These market clearing conditions, what can you take from them? They will connect, the first one will connect theta i, y, q1 and p1. And q1 is in terms, is itself a function of all of the same variables. So theta i, y, and p1. Meaning that this market clearing condition will give you p1 as a function of theta i and y. And what else did we have? Oh, u1. Yeah, u1 will also actually enter there. Sorry, from the, from the market clearing condition itself. So these market clearing conditions will give you the prices. And at this point, you will be able to verify that prices are indeed linear in the model, just as we assumed from the very beginning. So P1 is a linear function of everything we assumed it's a linear function of. And P2 is a linear function of everything that we assumed it is a linear function of. And as usual, this will give us one equilibrium of the model. There might be other equilibria which will have non-linear prices. We cannot say anything about those. We will just look at this particular equilibrium of this game. So this is what I just said. From market clearing you can verify that prices are indeed linear. And if you then match all the coefficients, meaning if you take those optimal demands and if, uh, and you will be able to calculate, sorry, at that point, these A's, B's and C's and E's and G's. So you, you will be able to calculate the optimal demands of both players as a function of, of their private signals, public signals, prices and Q's. So this will already give us the actually well-defined equilibrium strategies. And what we can see here, 
what you can do if you verify that, if you compute these coefficients, is that these demands will be increasing in private signals, in public signals, in price signals as well, and decreasing in price. So nothing unexpected really. The more you value the asset, the more you want to buy it. And the higher is the price, the less you want to buy. So this is all perfectly natural and reasonable. Now, uh, there is, however, one point that you can make here. In particular, if you look at demand of J agents, so D to J, the way you can re rewrite it is as ZJ minus Q2. So all of the terms except for ZJ will be absorbed by Q2. And this is the illustration that trading is driven by disagreement between agents. So if trader J has received a better signal than everyone else, than Q2, and Q2 is the measure of this average valuation that all other agents have for the asset, even though Q2 is actually only a signal of theta i, right, not theta, theta i. So you have to be a little careful here. But if you interpret it this way, you will see that the agent will demand positive amount if uh, he thinks that he values the asset above the average, demand negative if he thinks he values the asset below the average. So J traders trade due to a difference in their individual opinions. So there will be trade. And now we proceed to period one. We know how traders in period two behave, so we know how to compute period two price, P2. It will be, once again, given by the average expectation, average opinion of period J players, period two players uh, of theta, and also depend on U2. And if you plug this price into um, period one player's optimal strategy, you will obtain this lone and horrible expression. But the point that it, I'm making here is that this optimal demand of player one, of period one players, player eyes, will depend on their second order expectation of theta on their secondary beliefs. In particular, they will have some expectation given the information that they have, x, i, y, and q1. They will have some expectation of how agents in the second period will be valuing the asset. So agents in period one will have some beliefs about the beliefs of agents of period two agents. So second order beliefs do enter equilibrium strategies quite explicitly. And as we have seen in the example, as we have seen in the example, which was not actually an example, but rather part of the model, these second order expectations are decreasing in agents' private signals. Meaning that the higher, once again, the higher signal xi I get in period one, the lower I expect this uh, belief of period two agents to be. The lower is the price I expect to receive in period two for my asset. So second order expectation does enter equilibrium strategies. And um, yeah, so this divergence matters. So the paper considers a slightly more general model in addition to theta i and theta j uh, in the model Condor also has theta k which enters both agents signals so this is kind of a common component and he says that if this theta k does not actually matter then trading intensity volume and informational content of prices increase in public information 
So the more public information you have, the higher is trading volume. And here more public information means uh, more precise signal Y. So lower variance of epsilon Y. Okay? Meaning that public signals do actually create trade with this information structure. And this happens due to these signals effect on second order beliefs. So this takes up the most of the paper. He also qu quickly considers another version of the model, model 2, which looks at a setting in which um, both I and J traders coexist in period 1. So they are not the overlapping generations, but rather I traders are um, have short horizon, so they only trade for one period and then they quit, and J traders are um, living in both periods, so they have longer time horizon. You can think of I traders as day traders and J traders as pension savers, so short and long horizon investors. Within this model, he shows that, uh, sorry, if mu is the proportion of proportion of the long horizon traders, and he derives some comparative statics with respect to this mu. So high mu means that there are a lot of J traders, so there are few I traders, there are few short term traders, so there is no heterogeneity in trading horizons. And he interprets this as markets being well integrated when mu is high. And vice versa, when mu is small, uh, markets are not well integrated. And in a sense, results will, will be close to model 1 that we just considered. So if mu is small, you will have effect of public information. That we just described but when mu is high public information will behave as usual in the sense that it will affect the mid quote but it will not have a high effect on trading volumes so to summarize if mu is high effect on trading volumes is low if mu is small then public signals do generate do have a strong effect on trading volumes and uh, there is one empirical paper that he uses to support these results. In particular, Bailey, Caroli, and Salva find that price volatility and trading volumes... Uh, so first they have this general conclusion that price volatility and trading volumes increase after earnings announcements. So there is higher trading volumes around public announcements. But what they also find is that this effect is larger for cross-listed stock. And one interpretation you can have is that cross-listing is more or less the same as lower market integration or lower mu. Meaning that when your stock is cross-listed, you have different groups of traders on different exchanges which do not necessarily interact with each other that much. Meaning that um, we are back to model one and so public information has strong effect on trading volumes. While without cross-listing, all the market is more is better integrated, so you can have uh, so you have public information has less effect on trading volumes. So this is finally it. The takeaway from today is that you gotta be careful with, with the models, I guess. A lot of the standard models ignore some of the important things, in particular with respect to public information. So in most of the models that we see, public announcements do not affect trading volume, while in reality they more often than not do affect trading volume. And one way you can explain is relatively exotic approach with second-order beliefs. So the very short takeaway is that obscure epistemic game theory matters. And you should definitely look more into it. With this, we will end for today. Thank you for sticking around. I promised to go over time by a lot, and I did. Once again, we do have a class this Friday, 10 to 12, usual time. 
So I expect to see you all there, or I expect to see you on YouTube if you decide to observe the Labor Day. That's it, see you on Friday, and goodbye.